So welcome back uh, after lunch, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Brandel, and I have been invited to share this uh, afternoon session uh, before coffee. And we have three speakers. The first one is Professor Alexander Isayev from the University of North Carolina, who will present on neural networks learning quantum chemistry. Please. Question. So, uh, we'll s in my talk, we'll switch gear and you know mostly talk about neural networks and you know how we can use machine learning to accelerate quantum mechanical calculations. <coughs> so, it's I start with acknowledgement uh, because it's always not enough time uh, to finish. So, it's collaborative work with my group at UNC, group of Adrian Roiberg at the University of Florida now, as a group of Sergei Tretiak at Los Alamos and Generos funding from ONR, NSF, and NIH, and a lot of compute resources by the various institutions. Now, I think this is why we're here, right? So we see this, you know, chemical sciences really attracted with machine learning. And, you know, uh, instead of doing rigorous way of quantum mechanics. Uh, so recently we published this uh, uh, perspective in nature. When we have a look, kind of bird's eye view, on uh, application of machine learning in molecular uh, and material science. And you can kind of think uh, the type of application we do. And you can think about the several generation or scenarios. So for example, uh, type of the structure property calculation. And given a structure, we want to predict a property, right? And here we use some kind of local minimization algorithm. So when you run your f favorite quantum mechanical package and minimize geometry, you typically do something like that. Then we can increase the challenge. And for example, given the composition, we want to predict the property. Here we use some kind of global optimization algorithm and the type of the problems like a crystal structure prediction. So given um, um, you know, a structure of the molecule, can you predict the strict crystal structure? So this problem is still not solved. And and you can think about the third generation when the statistical driven design, when given some kind of data that can be literature, text, wherever, so you can use machine learning to predict composition structure and properties. Uh, and then we also, you know, in the paper, we, <coughs> we did different methods and approaches to this problem. Now, uh, and, uh, you know, in, our, in my lab and, you know, what, what many other people are doing, so when, when, you know, when you run your QM package, you know, you solve, for example, time independence for integration. equation. Uh, and as you know, so this is, you know, second order partial differential equation. So there is no analytic solution for anything practical. So instead, we rely on numeric solution of these equations. However, if you look on it from the point of view of machine learning, you can rearrange, and so your ground state energy would be some magic function with your input vector of your uh, molecules. And basically, it's a regression problem. So what we do, we use neural networks, and we like neural networks because they're differentiable. So you feed molecules, you get energy. So then you can backpropagate and get gradients, so you have forces. So you can do geometry minimization, molecular dynamics, and all other properties. So for the past couple of years, Adrian and I have been working on any deep neural network, uh, molecular potential. It's been, you know, this, uh, this paper with technical details, which actually uh, use neural networks, and you know, you can predict, and it's been trained on DFT. So, uh, why Ani? So this is Ani, and basically, given the proper training, basically what we want to do, we want to train the Padawan network, became the DFT Jedi Master. However, unlike the original scenario, we, don't, we want to avoid so no one would be hurt in this destination. And also, you know, you, you know when you look how convoluted uh, we, we went with the acronym and, you know, to kind of satisfy our nerdness, but also not to be sued by LucasArts. And, uh, and basically, you know, this is my flavor of, uh, of this diagram that Anatole show. So if you have some kind of metric of accuracy versus the cost, and here is a, actually it's not a cost, it's a scaling of our methods. And so you can, you can build this uh, kind of a diagram. 
So if you're interested in, 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 in running a large molecular system like proteins, so you have to rely on some kind of classical potential of force fields because of this, of this you know, scaling. Uh, however, the problem with force fields, you know, you cannot systematically guarantee their transferability, their accuracy, and sometimes these error bars can be huge, right? And so that's why, you know, you have to rely on, you know, rigorous quantum mechanics to, uh, you know, uh, to get more higher accuracy. And eventually, you know, would be nice to, if you can run the protein with a couple cluster. So what we try to achieve in our work, so we pick a particular reference, uh, level of theory, in our case it's range separated hybrid, uh, omega B97X from Martin Headgordon group, as our, it's our choice. So we publish the ANI1 potential. Then we improve a little bit and, you know, show the technical ideas how you can use active learning to be much more data efficient and, you know, improve transferability of your potential. And more recently, uh, we also, you know, I, you know, use a couple cluster as a reference theory, as then you can crank up accuracy a little bit. Now, so, so neural network are not magic. So what we do uh, in our way, so we transform uh, Cartesian coordinates in so-called uh, local atomic environments. So it's a, it's a all, a, all idea, uh, you know, proposed first by Bell and Parinella 10 years ago. So now our work, we use slightly different uh, uh, mathematical expression of the form, but the idea is the same. So you split your molecule into this atom-centered environment. Each environment passed through a neural network, so you get this kind of fictitious local energy of the environment, and you train it, you, you sum them up and train to a total QM energy, right? So with neural network, you train them by back propagation. Basically, you compute the cross gradients and update the network parameters to minimize the error. So basically, you run it uh, many, many cycles. Uh, so now work we're interested into not molecule specific potential, but more transferable. Uh, ideally for any, any molecule you can draw and run. So it, cost, it, it comes with a cost. Those things are extremely data hungry. So if you're interested, you know, all these data sets are available. And, and basically there are about 25 million uh, QM calculation for small organic molecules. Uh, again, so to use, uh, uh, to get those structures, we use GDB database, you know, uh, explicitly enumerated small organic molecules, in our case from white one to eight heavy atoms. And, and again, since we're interested in potential, so we use out of equilibrium geometry and bulk of this data actually, not the minima, but of the equilibrium geometries that's been uh, generated with the normal mode sampling. Run. Then you train, you test on some separate validation data. However, there are a couple of ways how you can test it. So the typical way how it's done in the, in the computer science, you, you, you're interested in interpolation, right? So if you train your system to eight heavy atoms, you test on a different system with the same size. However, as a chemist, this is not very interesting because we, we, we're looking into uh, some different types of molecules larger. So I argue that for us, you know, the, the testing on unknown sizes, so l larger system, would be more practical for a, you know, um, <clears throat> for a realistic, you know, uh, research uh, scenarios. So what we, what we developed, the set of benchmark data sets, and here just to show you the distribution of molecular sizes, this is the heavy atoms, this is a uh, uh, total number of atoms. This distribution in blue, this distribution of uh, molecules in our training data. So basically it's less than 10 heavy atoms. Uh, and then we have this extensibility uh, data set that, that's been uh, drawn from some real, you know, world molecules, for example, drug approved FDA drugs and some small peptides, but actually probes to which, uh, much larger molecular sizes, more than 100 atoms. There are a few examples of those drug-like molecules. So you see typical, you know, polar, non-polar molecules. And we also include a couple of these uh, more challenging examples, like small proteins, where you can afford to run single point uh, DFT on them. So we put a couple of those proteins, and they are a few hundred atoms in sizes. Now, one of the critique when you develop those machine learning methods are 
or not on, only critique, but you know how we can trust them and when we can trust them. And one of the approach is to use active learning. And one of the simplest way of the active learning is 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 use query by committee or you know ensemble disagreement. Uh, so just to briefly show you uh, what it is, imagine I trained several neural networks, and you know I made the prediction in in a particular phase space. So you can see. There are certain regions where this prediction agree, but also the region where they disagree. So we can do then, you know, if since they are small organic molecules, you can go back to QM and run QM calculations. And now what, what we and some other people, uh, and many other people show is that actually, you know, uh, for many cases, uh, when those predictions are agree, uh, typically we have a good data coverage and in this phase space where they disagree, basically we either have overfit or a bad data coverage. So you can use this approach, essentially, without running any QM data, just looking at the ensemble disagreement to pick your next training molecules. And what it allow us, allows you to do is actually fully automated framework how to parameterize those uh, uh, ML based potentials. So you can essentially throw a kitchen sink of all the data you can think. And you know, you can train the ensemble of this of this neural network and then you score and rank all your data and, and calculate this disagreement. So then you batch you you know and run them on your com on, on your HPC resources, update the database, basically retrain your ensemble and Basically, this loop is almost fully automated. So, in contrast to training and refitting your standard, uh, you know, classical force uh, field types, which requires a lot of manual work, updating those neural, you know, machine learning uh, parameters uh, potential in general is f almost fully automated. And again, so this is this work been published in this special uh, GCP issue that Anatole mentioned uh, this year. <coughs> Now, in addition uh, that uh, to fully automated training, basically active learning allows you to be much more data efficient. So when we publish, so again, so what's, what's this uh, figure show you that you know, on our realistic uh, benchmark data set, uh, original any one potential that been trained to very large number of molecules, but we selected them. Essentially, it was a random selection. And the transferability was not very good. So the RMSC and N, uh, uh, error were around uh, 12 kcal per mole. However, if you do a data selection through active learning procedure, and so let's show you data size, basically by the point when you select it at 2 million data points, you already can match this accuracy with 10, 10x data reduction. And you can go on and on. And by the five million data points, you essentially lower this error fourfold. So uh, it's 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 more accurate, and it's much more data efficient. So I think you know if you do if you do training of, of the potential like that, you know it's it it, and if you do random sampling, you should definitely have a look on that. So basically, you what we see is universal improvement into accuracy of the energies, forces, and you know for uh, every benchmark you can think of. Now, since we're interested in molecular simulations, uh, you know, the type of, uh, the, the, the quality of forces, what you can get, just to give you a perspective, so this is the, keep in mind, so this is a log plot or, of density plot. So essentially all the, all the, all, all the points here in red of the, of the forces from the, uh, from the force field versus the reference DFT forces. So you'll get the accuracy of, uh, uh, roughly RMSC, uh, about 4 kcal per mole per uh, anstrom. Uh, and basically, the, the, the accuracy of those forces are very favorably compared with even semi-empirical methods, like density functional type binding and PM6, that have two and four times larger errors. Now, in addition to energies, you know, we can predict different properties. For, for, for example, what we also uh, worked uh, quite extensively this year, we can we can predict partial molecular uh, partial atomic charges. Uh, you can predict, you know, uh, standard schemes, you know, uh, 
like CM5, Hirschfeld or natural charges. However, we ask neural network a question. Since those charges are not physically observable, and they can have a look because, so this, this plot gives you a correlation between different charge schemes. And you can see, you know, depending on what your scheme you use, basically those charges can be all over the place. Because this partitioning is, 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 is arbitrary, depending on the choice of the particular scheme. So what we did in this paper, uh, however, molecular dipole is physically observable. So if we ask a neural network to do, to reconstruct a dipole and learn charges by itself, so that these charges would reconstruct computed QM dipole. And so basically, that's what we did. Uh, you, so, you know, the neural network, you know, predict your dipole and also uh, partial atomic charges that would make this dipole. So we constrained only to, uh, to a molecular dipole. What is also interesting, it gives us a very high accuracy in prediction of quadrupole. Uh, however, we didn't constrain them. But also what's interesting, so we called the, our scheme, AC, uh, charge scheme ACA, uh, it actually closely resembles the CM5, charge model 5 scheme that was fitted to experimental dipole. And, and basically, this is this one of the way you can reconstruct yeah, you know, those, those dipoles. However, here it's, it's unbiased because we didn't fit to any you know, uh, empirical data. Now, what's, uh, when we have these components, what it allows us to do, now we can do everything with machine learning. So I can run, for example, I can run my molecular simulation with machine learning, uh, predict charges, reconstruct the dipole, and then, for example, I can compute IR spectra and everything with MD. So here is as a couple of examples for some of the drug-like molecules when, when we run time domain uh, machine ML MD simulations. And you know this comparison with QM, and you see you know it's a very nice correspondence between machine learning and QM, and also you know very nice uh, accuracy of type as well. Now, as been as been referred by several speakers this morning, sometimes you know what if we need accuracy beyond DFT. Uh, so what we are, we've been looking at way how how we can run couple cluster simulation on a scale. Because those, those methods are data hungry. And if you do conventional couple clusters, it's simply too much to compute and you know, it's, it's way too expensive. So we were looking for approximate couple cluster uh, calculation. However, to really get the high accuracy, you need to do your computation and the complete basis set limit. And the, the total, uh, you know, complete basis set energy would be, you know, this, you know, CBS hard refocus piece plus MP2 uh, plus this, this correction for the, so this is standard Helgecker type extrapolations. So what, what really kills you this, uh, you know, conventional couple cluster term, which is extremely expensive because of this 07 uh, scaling. So what we are looking is to replace it with the approximate couple cluster. And again, so we have this extrapolation inside extrapolation scheme, when we use this DLPNO, you know, uh, approximate couple cluster, and, and again, so we, uh, which has, uh, you know, a couple of different parameters. So what it allows you to do, so that's accuracy of the conventional CBS, and so this, this is um, the CBS with a star, which we replace conventional couple cluster with approximate, and uh, and you can immediately see, for example, the compute expense for aspirin, which have only, has only 21 atoms, is more than 400 hours just to do the single points. However, in the approximate scheme, basically, you reduce it to 50x. And as you can see for the you know, energy deviation uh, for the a couple of benchmark data set, basically, you, you're not losing much of the energy. However, you really gain in the compute so what we, what we did next, now we have the way how to run, you know, uh, high throughput couple cluster calculations. And now uh, what we did, uh, we use ideas so called transfer learning because we already have very nice uh, data set and trained neural network with the accuracy of DFT. And it would be stupid not to use it, not to take advantage of all this data. So what we, 
what you decided to do, so for example, what you can take your you know, DFT trained neural network and copy all these parameters to your couple cluster neural network. Then what we did was fix a couple of layers. And so you retrain only part, part of the parameters of your neural network. And now you train on your couple cluster data. And again, we use a couple of cycles of active learning. And, and now you have kind of a Frankenstein uh, models that have been you know, trained part of the uh, DFT data and then retrained uh, with the couple cluster data. However, what we show in many cases, and I show a couple of benchmarks, it actually exceeds the accuracy of the, of the parental DFT methods in, in some cases. So one of the challenging examples for DFT, for example, reaction energies, uh, or for example, if you take this uh, you know, cage uh, hydrocarbon system and do reaction of isomerization, for example, to this guy or to this guy, so you, you, you're making several of these conjugated systems. And so this reaction ID, and this is the, the error. So the, the error of, of our parental omega B97X is, is ridiculous. It's a disaster. So it, it can be as high as 20 to 40 kcal per mole. That was, you know, Marcus was showing. So this is, this is, extre it is, a, is, a, is a terrible error. However, and, and, and basically our neural network trained on DFD data obviously, you know, have this error, so it, it, it mimics this behavior. However, the, the network's been essentially fine-tuned on couple cluster data. These errors are substantially reduced to one or two kcal. And so the, and the error of our approximation, again, is, is the same order. And in the paper, we, we show a couple of uh, other benchmarks. However, I'm short on time. So what's what also interesting, we we also interested in, 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 in drug discovery and, and reliable generation of uh, three-dimensional conformers for molecules. Uh, so the is a is a nice paper by a, a Genentech group that uh, analyze you know accuracy of different methods from the force fields DFT for, uh, and you know some of the postcard fog methods for the accuracy of the of the the hydral profile when you rotate. Uh, some group around the, around the bone. So what, what we show, what, and, and then, so we took this b benchmark data set to see what's the accuracy of our methods. So the, the ANI been trained on the, on the DFT data, see it's here. Basically, it's better than any of the standard uh, state-of-the-art force fields, but it trails the DFT. So with this a little bit couple cluster data, basically the ANI CCX, uh, it, it exceeds accuracy of all the all the functionals that's been. This one, that's a good question. It's it's one really weird system. Uh, let's. I'll show you. I'll I'll show you an an example. It's it's uh, it's 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 really weird. You know the combination of atoms that makes this the hydro angle. Uh, so basically, uh, and in this paper, they, they tested a bunch of different functionals. And I showed just a couple of here. Uh, basically, what we what we're able to achieve, so the, the, the accuracy of this um, any potential is, is better than any of the, in DFT in the training, and basically trails this very expensive, uh, you know, MP2 couple. Now, can we, what can, can we do and go beyond the simple uh, fit into energies? Now, we can combine all these all this pieces together. And for example, we can do a multimodal training. So we can train at the same time to energies and charges and all other properties you can imagine. And um, so this, this paper is, under, is currently under review, but it's available on uh, chem, arch chem archive preprint. So basically, we we were rethinking the the architecture of the neural network, and you know, and be be able to you know add these different modules and you know different uh, um, different features, and also training on the on, on the multiple uh, properties at the same time. So what's interesting is uh, 
it allows you to do and you know get the same accuracy of of the energy and forces but also uh, all these properties at the same time so you're not gaining any you know you're not losing anything but in return what you get you get all of them in one shot so you dramatically accelerate you know uh, availability of all the pro of the properties in, in one shot and and we also were thinking about the iterative uh, block in this neural network, which essentially uh, effectively passes messages uh, between different neighbors. And it allows you to do, still keep our local, uh, you know, uh, feature uh, descriptor, but pass this long range information. That's been actually a problem for some of these uh, uh, methods. And so to illustrate that, so the T is this, this number of iteration and basically, as, as you increase you know, the, the number of iterations, you, you actually gain an, an accuracy. And it converges at the step of three because of the sizes of our molecules are not very large. But essentially, uh, I can probably skip again. So to illustrate why it's, it's important, you can think about this, uh, the kind of toy system when you have sulfur, which is conjugated, uh, and you modulate different um, uh, electron donating or withdrawing group here. So if this group is is farther than the cutoff of your geometry descriptor, essentially all neural nets would, of, of, uh, with the local descriptor, would predict the the charge on the sulfur to be exactly the same because this uh, the substituent is is beyond the cutoff. However, with the iterative scheme. Essentially, you you pass this information beyond the cutoff, and basically you can quantitat quantitatively reproduce the uh, uh, correct quantum mechanical behavior. What is also interesting, this architecture allows you easily add different properties. So, for example, it's been trained to uh, you know ground state uh, energies and gas and, and and charges. So we are thinking, can we add uh, more properties? And uh, and train you know um, more efficiently, and we are thinking to uh, do in, you know prediction of the implicit solvent effect because you know the charges, the atomic volumes, that's that's those pieces that are important for implicit solvent. Uh, so you you trivially just add this extra extra neural net to predict uh, the salvation energy. Again, we use SMD uh, with the same. Um, uh, DFT functional and given only 5% of the total data set, you can train uh, SMD to, to the same energy uh, error about 1 kcal per mole. However, you know, the, the salvation free energy uh, can be measured and there is an MNSOL database being maintained by the, at the University of Minnesota that has extensive number of Gibbs free energy of salvation for drug-like molecules. And none of these molecules in our uh, training data. And basically, we get the RMSC 1.8 kcal per mole. And, uh, and very nice R square. And this is the, the experimental versus predicted. And here, you keep in mind, so we calculated everything with machine learning uh, with the, you calculate the frequency and the, uh, the, the thermal correction, everything done with the neural network. and and. Basically, this error 1.8, it's about the same as between a couple of different functionals or different approximation to the continuum solvent. So this is as good as it can go. Now, um, just to conclude, you know, what I think we're going to you know, uh, see you know, next, this and next year, uh, it's really exciting. So when these methods, we've been actively developing. So now I think it's a, it's a prime time to, to show that we can really do new science and you know solve the problems, and just to show you a couple of examples what we can do even now. So we can take my neural network potential that's been trained on the small organic molecules. I can go to PTB, take the protein with the ligand. Uh, we cannot do ions yet, but I can I can put my protein into the distilled water, so this you distilled. Uh, and put the periodic box and you know so total system size of 35,000 atoms and again we have seven elements parameterized so far you can run the simulation with you know explicit water periodic boundary conditions 
and what you see is really boring movie, which is great because what potential is, is essentially doing doesn't disintegrate the protein, doesn't explode. So you still see the, you know, the secondary structure, the, the ligand where it should be. So at least qualitatively, it learns enough about uh, you know, the, the protein wants to be folded. And what's I interesting is, well, during this simulation, what the student did a trivial mistake. It was automatically protonated. So what happens, you see this, um, um, this arginine was deprotonated, and so there's a carboxylic group that was protonated, which is totally wrong and uh, under physiological conditions because this, uh, you know, acidic. And, but what happened during the simulation, essentially you see the proton transfers. Because those potentials are fully reactive, you can be a little bit more forgiving. And you can basically, it allows you to do realistic simulation with the pH changes. This is a really huge problem for the classical force fields. Finally, let me close with even more fascinating examples. When what we did, we go and we simulate this hot carbon vapor. So it's, it's 4,000 atoms of hot carbon, 2,500 degrees, again, 60 atom periodic box, a high temperature simulation. You start from random gas. What you see, formation of the graphene flakes. There is a formation of the fullerene. You see the, the buckyball here. And then some of these uh, uh, flakes uh, goes to a, you know, larger nanotubes. And again, this is the same, the same pot you know, potential without re explicit retraining for this case. What it shows you is that it learns enough to understand that carbon wants to be conjugated six membrane rings. Those results probably quantitatively wrong, but at least I, there is a hope that you know, some physics is captured there. So with that, let me uh, leave you with that. So if you're interested, we have the, uh, uh, it's all in GitHub. So we have the, the um, uh, connector to the AC atomic simulation environment. We have implementation on PyTorch and all the data is available to anyone who want to try. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a question. Yes. No, not yet. Metals are, because for metals you need a spin depending on spin state. Well, well, in principle, yes. So if given, if, if someone would compute those charges, we can trivially train. But at least it's, it's just organic standard. Yes, for QM charges. One more question. Yeah, sometimes it's terrible. So, so the question, if we repeat it. Yeah, okay, so the question was, uh, did we make an estimate about the accuracy in the bulk phase, right, simulation? Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's quite, uh, yeah, so uncertainty is quite high, yeah. So you see that's really some of the data is, uh, some of this phase space is underfitted. So we can, we can think about the training to some, you know, condensed phase data, for example, you know, carbon or you know even you know pieces of you know clusters to to account for that thank you very much we should proceed <laughs> the next speaker is from uh, the university of cambridge in the uk it's uh, professor lucy colwell and she will present on machine learning with deep feature graphs leads to interpretable models that predicts reaction performance. I hope that was correct. <laughs> so please.
nice arrangement. That means I can spend a year working at Google um, and then take the skills back to the university. And as a consequence of this new Google affiliation, I have updated the cover slide of my talk to reflect some of the equipment that we have available at Google. So these are these new TPU pods, um, which are extremely fast at carrying out calculations. Um, and also, I've given this broader title, Accelerating Science Discovery with Machine Learning. Oh, yeah, can you not hear me? Oh, thanks. Oh, yeah. Is it good? Can people hear? Yes, good. Thank you very much. OK, so I actually have promised that I will advertise um, a little bit about science at Google at the start of my talk. Um, so I am on this Google Accelerated Science team, which I believe Anatole in particular has worked with extensively. Um, but they're basically a team where the goal is to increase the rate of science discovery using Google technologies. The idea is to partner with experts in various fields across physics, chemistry, biology, and beyond, um, and to try and use some of the tools that are developed at Google to make impact in science. And so there are some links here uh, describe a bit of the work that has come from this group. And the reason that I'm talking about this is that we're anxious to recruit interns. So if anyone is doing a PhD or a postdoc and would like to be an intern, we currently have this advert out. Please uh, you know, have a look at it. Think about applying. Um, if you just Google, this link is ridiculous. So if you just Google Google research intern, then you will find this advert, essentially. It's like the second hit or something. Um, and we also have this uh, AI residency program it's like a one-year program. It's a bit like a postdoc. So you can come and spend a year at Google and uh, join the research projects um, and then go on and do something else. And so most people have a strong AI background, but we also have people who are scientists who are really trained in science, who go, are sort of learning some of these techniques uh, during the 12 months that they spend there. Um, and so this link here has all the information if anybody is interested. So. I'm going to talk first briefly, actually, a bit about protein ligand binding, just because I want to connect this to some of the neural network work that we heard about previously. So when I went to Google, I got very interested in some of these deep neural networks they, they have built to predict protein ligand binding. So this was sort of the approach before uh, people made these end-to-end -end differentiable models. So you, had, you, know, you have your molecule here, and then you have some kind of featureization algorithm so you turn your molecule into a descriptor, like a fingerprint or something along those lines. Perhaps it starts from the 2D structure or the 3D structure, or even just which atoms are present. Right? And then once you have that feature vector, you then build That would be better. Is that is that work? Does it work? It's on. It has a green light. I mean, <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. I think it works. It works. Okay, great. All right, I'll hold it. We'll give you something to hold. Okay, so this is how people did things before. Of course, you know, we had a revolution in building models and images where people used to use handcrafted features, which they spent a lot of time working on, and they've since moved to these deep neural networks, which you can train end-to-end -end and which learn the features themselves. And so people, of course, have translated this idea to the space of small molecules, um, where you simply learn the representation from as part of the machine learning algorithm. And so the group that I joined at Google developed these uh, graph convolutions, or was one of the first groups to publish these graph convolutions. So it was a neural network architecture designed specifically for molecules. And you just put in the atoms and bond. And the idea was that you can iterate this sort of weave module an arbitrary number of times to learn complex functions of chemical neighborhoods. And that was subsequently um, rephrased, in a sense, as a message passing neural network. So there were these exciting sort of um, advances in the architectures that people use to build networks and molecules. And these were particularly sort of demonstrated uh, in the application of protein ligand binding. Right? So we have this nice 
protein structure here, this is a beta-2 adrenergic receptor, we know some set of ligands that bind to this protein, and we'd like to build a model that will predict what other ligands will bind to that receptor. And it turns out that these models perform really well. So this is a table in this paper in 2016. Um, these are essentially three data sets that people looked at, and the first three lines of this table are sort of traditional models. So we have like logistic regression and random forests um, and this maximum similarity. And then we have the sort of baseline, which were neural networks built on fingerprints. And then these were these new architecture neural networks built directly on the graph. And I think the takeaway here is that, in general, the neural networks are able to outperform the original models, at least to some extent. Right? They're looking good. I wouldn't say it was like a clear win in any sense, but, but the AUC is, in general, better. So that's great. Right? We can build these really deep neural networks on these data sets, we split them into test, train and test data sets, and they can predict well on, on the test data. But we might want to ask, what do these models really learn? Right? Like, as a chemist, it would be really nice if we could actually sort of examine these models and ask them why they're making the prediction that they do. I'd like, really like to know what the pharmacophores are. Why does this molecule bind to this protein receptor? Can you tell me? And can I then use that knowledge to design a better binder, a better ligand? Right? If I want to do lead optimization or any of these sort of tasks, I really need to know how to move in the space, and so I need to be able to examine the network. And of course, people have addressed this question in many contexts, in particular in, in sort of image analysis, and they developed attribution techniques in order to discover or try and examine what the network's learning. And so we'd like to use that in the context of protein ligand binding, right? so we can figure out what the pharmacophores are. Now, I think it's fair to say that to apply attribution methods and to be able to really judge them, right, we need data sets where we know what the answer is. Right? We need to know why the ligand binds to the receptor. Otherwise, if we have too many unknowns here, if we don't really know what the answer is, then we don't know if you know, the attribution method works properly and we don't know if the network learned the right thing. And of course, for most proteins, we don't know that answer. Right? That's like the million dollar question. If we knew that, we'd be in better shape. So we decided that what we would do is we would simply construct some data sets in which it was like a sort of fictitious imaginary protein receptor. And we would say that a ligand bound to it if it had a certain combination of fragments present in its molecular graph. OK, so this sounds kind of crazy, right? We're making toy data sets. But the key thing is that then we would know what the answer was for that data. And so these are the, the fragments that we considered with their smile strings, and there's a little sort of diagram representing them. And these are the logics that we, we came up with. There's 16 logics here. And they kind of get increasingly more complex as you go down the table. So they're very simple to start off with. You know, simply, you have to have no primary amine. And in that case, you can bind this protein. But by the time you get down to the end, it's getting quite complicated. Right? There are sort of multiple clauses in this logic. And so we're really you know, starting to get close, perhaps, to what real proteins are like. And so we're going to use each of these logics to scan the zinc database to identify ligands that do or don't bind the protein. So we're just constructing a fake data set here. So we have 16 fake data sets with positives and negatives. right? And you know, there's always data set bias. You know, that's a big issue in chemistry. So we're going to be very careful to balance our synthetic data sets. We're going to sample equally from all combinations of negations of the functional groups that make up each logic. So we tried really hard to make this as balanced as possible. I right? wanted this to be an ideal case. And we're going to sample 1,200 molecules for each combination, um, which meant that we end up with really quite large data sets. So we have all of this data. And we train models on these data sets. So there's 16 data sets. We're going to train both graph convolutional models and MPNN models. And it turns out that, as you might expect, this is quite an easy task. Right? These data sets are beautifully clean. There's no noise. You know, it's very simple. Ligand either binds or it doesn't bind. And so the neural networks do really well at this task. Right? They get 1.0 AUC, or very close to it, for every single one of the data sets that we tried. So that's great. We have a whole load of really well-trained neural networks. And you know, we can now examine whether they learned the correct logic or not. And so to do that, we're going to invent a quantitative attribution method 
where we use integrated gradients, which is one of the techniques that has been published recently, to calculate an attribution score for each atom in the input molecule. And so there's a little example here where I've sort of numbered the atoms. And so here are the indices, and here was the score that the attribution method gave them. Right? So in this case, it seems like this ring here was really important, or at least the model thinks it's really important, and so it's given it a lot of weight, whereas it sort of ignored most of the rest of the molecule. And as it turns out, in the logic that we used, that ring was important. So those atoms all got a, a label of 1, and the other atoms got a label of 0. So this was really perfectly classified. All we ask is that the, the ones, the atoms that had a 1 label, get higher scores than the atoms that get a 0 label. And so we can literally compute an attribution AUC using these rankings. So we can do this for all the models we've trained in our 16 data sets. We can report the attribution AUC in this table. And for the simple logics, everything's pretty good, right? Like the model appears to learn the correct thing. But as the logic gets more complicated, even in this case where we have like perfectly clean data without any experimental error or anything, we're really starting to have issues with what exactly the model is learning. So at this point, it could either be that the attribution is wrong or the model has learned the wrong thing, right? So we need to try and distinguish between these two cases. And we don't really have a great way of distinguishing these cases. But what we can do is try and uh, exploit the attributions to find adversarial attacks. Right now, if we can do this, it suggests the attributions are correct, right? So essentially, we take this particular example. So we have a binder. And the model correctly predicts it binds. It says that probably binding is 0 0.97. And so when I say binds, I mean it satisfies this logic. Right? So it has this correct combination of fragments. But the attributions are sort of a bit funny. Right? Like There's quite a lot of attribution on these features here, which are not at all included in my logic. And so perhaps that means that I can perturb this molecule so it still satisfies the logic, but the model gets it wrong. And indeed, that's the case, right? So I can simply just add an extra carbon into that side chain next to the primary amine. And lo and behold, the model is now predicting that it doesn't bind anymore, even though it does. So I can use these attributions. I can exploit them to, to, to fool the classifier, which suggests that the attributions are correct, and the model is actually learning the wrong thing. And so I suppose what this means is that the model is learning some signal that correlates with the binding logic, but isn't actually the binding logic itself. And it sort of suggests that perhaps you can construct a test. So if you have some hypothesis, and you have a data set, right, you can actually kind of ask whether the data set contains enough information to really test that hypothesis, or whether you need to augment your data set, or, or you know, aim for a simpler model, or regularize, or so on and so forth. Um, and so we hope that that will be sort of constructive, uh, because otherwise it seems like a sort of disappointing result. Honestly, we'd hoped it would be possible to do a better job than we could. So I now want to talk about what I said I was going to talk about in my title, um, which is essentially using large data sets. They're sort of large. They're not really large enough. And that was why I put that, that previous example in as a sort of warning that your data sets are not large, you need to be careful. But we'd like to predict reaction outcomes. So I have some colleagues in the department at Cambridge who developed this high throughput quantitative experimental platform by which they can uh, carry out many, many reactions and quantitatively measure the output. Right? So you have this large plate, like a 384 well plate. You um, uh, many combinations of components into these wells and then leave it for 12 hours and use something like mass spec or LCMS in this case to measure how much of your reaction product you obtained. And so we started off by looking at a chan lam coupling reaction. We'd really like to be able to optimize this reaction. Um, it's useful for making um, CN bonds uh, and pharmaceutically relevant compounds. And so we wanted to ask, you know, given a new boronic ester, so that's this piece here, if we have a, a different R group, different molecule here, can we predict the reaction outcome? And can we propose a catalyst and a base that will give optimal yield? 
this is sort of a combinatorial situation, right? There are many bronic esters, many catalysts, many bases. Um, and in fact, there's also ligands that we can put into this reaction to try and make it better. And we'd like to know, we'd like to be able to train a model that tells us how to run a particular reaction. And so when I say combinatorial, there's you know, many options for each piece. In this key case, we kept the amine the same, but we tried many boronic esters, um, six copper catalysts, and seven bases. And so the problem is that even though we were running these reactions on 384 well plates, there's so many components here that actually the number of unique combinations is quite large. And so even though we ended up with a lot of data, we actually somehow there's, there's many hypotheses being tested. And so we're actually in a sort of low data regime, um, which makes things difficult. But essentially, we just want to find that we can write the yield as some function of the input molecules, right? Well, that function could be like a random forest, like some model, some black box model, um, or whatever happens to, to work well. So um, this is work that was really done by a postdoc in my group called Carl Polking. Um, we came up with a number of features of the molecules that we felt would be relevant for this reaction. Um, essentially, what, because we have little amount of data, we want to encode as much information that we know about physics or about chemistry into the model. And so we sort of thought about using structural features, but we really ended up focusing on these physiochemical features. So properties of these molecules that we could calculate, uh, typically using sort of quantum calculations, and also some that we measured. So we actually put in some measured NMR data. Um, and the choice of these descriptors is obviously really important. Um, and so the idea was to sort of think about the reaction mechanism to suggest important features. Um, yeah. Essentially, the problem with this case is that we really just don't have enough data to sort of make things tricky. But there was a paper that was published recently in Science that tackled a similar problem. They looked at the bookfold hartbig cross-coupling reaction. Um, and again, they had sort of many versions of each uh, component. Um, and they uh, parameterized them using physiochemical descriptors. So when this paper came out, we were like, oh, OK, you know, somebody else had the same idea. At least we're not being completely crazy. But this paper actually makes a really interesting point because they take all of their data, right? So they've combined all of these different catalysts and um, uh, components, and they, they've carried out all these experiments, and they simply make a 30, 70 random set of the data, and they use that to build a model. And the problem is that if you split your data randomly, right, then the chances are that every component will be seen in the training set. Not every combination will be seen in the training set, but every component will be seen. Right? And that means that you can make a prediction for a component just by kind of transferring knowledge. Right? Like if I have this component in one combination, then I can sort of just uh, predict that it will be roughly the same as in another combination. Right? So you have to be really careful with how you do the splits. And I think that's shown by the fact that if you use these physiochemical descriptors, you get a very nice plot. Here are the black dots of the training data and the blue dots of the test data. But if you use a structural descriptor, you get pretty much the same performance. But it seems that that should know less about what happens. And more to the point, actually, if you just use labels, if you don't tell it anything about chemistry at all, right? then you still get really what's pretty reasonable performance. Right? So when you carry out these splits, you have to be really careful. And this is just the sort of way that we did this, this label only prediction, essentially we just, you know, if you change uh, the x1, we just use the other the terms belonging to the other components to make the prediction. We just kept the, left the x1 out. And you can do this well without even considering it. So there's like a lot of information leakage here. You have to be really careful. So this is, I think, an example of combinatorial bias, right? So you predict the outcome of a new molecular combination just by sort of tracing subsets back to the ones you've already seen. So how can you get around this? Well, essentially, because we had so little data, we ended up having to invent a sort of molecular term decomposition. Wow, I'm really doing well here uh, with the, the logistics. So essentially, we just sort of uh, make an expansion where we um, take this effective Gibbs energy. And this is writing the yield of this equation. 
And we just write it out as you normally would expand it with sort of single body terms and then pair terms. And then we just expand the exponentials, assuming that things are small. So there's nothing particularly original here. But essentially, we're saying that perhaps you can write the total yield as individual terms from the component. And there are some second order terms which we might be able to infer if we're really lucky. Right? So then we can sort of figure out the effect caused by adding a new component just by sort of um, handling the data carefully. So once we've done all that, we need to learn these terms from the data. So if I'm interested in the Bronick ester in particular, I'm going to take the partial yield, which is just caused by that Bronick ester, and I'm going to try and regress it against the data. And because I have so little data, I'm actually going to use a sort of functional regression approach, right? where I'm going to construct a graph of um, sort of a single variable and paired variable terms. And I'm going to use that graph to explore a space of nonlinear functions to find a functional form of the input descriptors that correlates well for the training data. And this is really dangerous. Right? I have very little data, and I'm allowing myself to have nonlinear functions. So like, I'm guaranteed to get really good correlations, right? because if I try enough things, of course, I'm going to get a really good correlation. So I have to be really careful about the, the, the statistics. Um, and so essentially, we use what we call a random physics-based null distribution, where we sort of swizzle all of the columns of the input descriptors, and then we recalculate everything. And we recalculate everything very many times using sort of bootstraps so that we can get a good null distribution. Um, essentially, we're using sure independent screening, which people have used before, I think, in, in materials in order to give ourselves a strong null. And so we're asking that things really sort of leak out beyond the null distribution. So there's lots of statistics here, which I'm not going to go through. But essentially, we end up with functions uh, for those partial, those, those molecular terms. And it's sort of interesting. I don't think we can really say that these functions are the right answer in any sense, but it seems that they correlate well with the right answer. right? And it means that we're writing like an equation for the predicted outcome of a reaction in terms of the input molecules. Um, and I suppose, I suppose, so I, I should also admit at this point that I'm like a mathematician by training. So it's unclear to me why it's not possible to do this in chemistry. So maybe this is, yeah. So it seems to me you should be able to write equations for reactions. Of course, you know, these equations are not unique. This is the, the function that happened to correlate the best. But we put in physiochemical descriptors. They, they all correlate with each other, right? So there are many other things that could have been there. And so we tried to, you know, to, to, to give an impression of that with these visualizations, where essentially we're trying to ask, you know, what are the things that correlate the most from the input descriptors? These are all very physiochemical properties. And you can sort of see that there are, there are areas of these graphs where things all have strong colored lines. And the strong colored lines imply that they, they correlate quite heavily. And that just means that instead of this particular functional form, it could have been something else that correlates highly with that functional form. Right? So these equations aren't unique, but they are at least equations. And what's interesting is that they do quite a lot better than the best conventional model that we came up with. So here we're using a random forest. These plots are all leave compound out plots. So we've taken all the data, so you do one compound, taken it out, put it in the test set. So we've built a model using the other compounds and made a prediction for this uh, remaining compound. And so they're not beautiful, the plots, the ones at the top. They are better than the random forest plots. And I guess, given the amount of data we had, we're, uh, I don't know, relieved that we, we, we could get something that was interesting. Um, yeah, so this, that was the buchwald hartwig reaction. This is the Chan-Lam reaction that we, our collaborators generated data for. Um, and that's pretty much all I have to say. Um, or maybe what I could say in conclusion is that we have to worry a lot about bias, um, in particular when data sets are small. Um, well, actually, also, I guess the first example show we have to worry about bias even when we seem to have plenty of data. Um, and what we found is that the statistical filtering gave us sparse, although approximate, solutions. Um, we also were able to get confidence limits, which we think is kind of interesting. Um, and we're keen to sort of examine this and if there ever is going to be a case where we have too much data. Um, it'll be interesting. I actually have another example uh, for an asymmetric hydrogenation reaction I can show you where we're able to make a nice prediction out of sample. But 
I didn't really have enough time even to do this. Um, and yeah, you know, even if attribution is possible, um, we also, of course, have to do interpretation, right? So I guess this is suggesting that uh, all of this AI is really great, but if we want to actually think through the meaning of the functions that we've implied, we still have to have a human in the loop. Um, so um, thanks very much for listening. Time for one or two questions. Yes. 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 So you're saying that because, I mean, all of the data that I showed you, well, I guess at least the second half of the talk kind of had like, it must have been full of noise, right? There's noise everywhere. And we could estimate the noise. I think it was like 10% or something, essentially, the noise in the measurements. It's really large. Um, I mean, we can deal with this by you know, adding more points where we draw the outcome from the distribution that we suspect is a noise distribution. We can try and do this kind of thing. Um, I mean, I don't know. For me, it was a shock in the first example that even when we don't have any noise, right? There really wasn't any noise. That should have worked. But we couldn't get it to work. So you know, or rather, these neural networks would learn anything. Right, like anything that looks like you know signal that works, that's what they'll learn. They're lazy, essentially. Um, so I think for me that that was really surprising. That we were expecting that to be true. It was actually it was an intern project. I should confess, it was a project we gave to an intern, right? And like you know, like all good intern projects, um, the poor person doing it <laughs> <laughs> couldn't get it to work, and we were like, well, come on. Um, yeah, and then we realized that actually it just doesn't work. I mean, it's not that simple. So yeah, it took a bit of time to sort of push through. Um, obviously, the QM case is also really nice, where you have uh, essentially noise-free or very little noise in the data. Um, but I don't know, have people really done attribution in a, on the quantum mechanical neural networks? Uh -huh. No, no, but I mean for the neural network, right? So you train the neural network on the quantum mechanical data, right? And then you, it, it, it predicts, but like, I, 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 don't, I don't know if anyone has done this. I mean, it's just if we want them to extrapolate, right, then you sort of have to have them hope that they predict for the right reason. I would, maybe. No? <laughs> yes, and we need to proceed with the schedule. And uh, we can thank the speaker again. Uh, so uh, the final speaker before coffee. Uh, will be uh, Professor Koji Tsuda from the University of Tokyo in Japan, uh, who will present about machine learning algorithms for designing metamaterials. Oh, okay. Yes. Um. What? Yes, do it. Ah, uh, yeah, right. cables. Oh, okay. Good. Oh, okay. Um. Okay. Thanks for introduction. My name is Koji Tsuda from uh, Tokyo, and. Uh, and actually, I, I, I have positions at NIMS and Rikin as well. And uh, um, I'd like to talk about how to use machine learning to design uh, materials. And I, I'm actually a computer scientist, so I'm, I'm not so familiar with physics and chemistry. And uh, um, But in this, I don't know, four, four years, five years, I have been collaborating with a lot of material scientists to create new materials. And, uh, and what I have been doing is, uh, automatic materials design. And, uh, um, and I use actually machine learning um, to drive simulation and experiments to come up with 
um, new materials. Right? And, um, and basically, uh, machine learning is a, uh, what, what ex machine learning does is experimental design. So basically, uh, when you have large candidates of materials, then what you would do normally is, is to uh, apply simulation to all of candidates and, and, and come up with good ones, or do experiments and, and, and come up with good ones. Right? And, uh, and what, what I do here is to, uh, to somehow um, to let machine learning choose um, experiment uh, you know, candidates and then do simulation and get, get data out of it and then use, um, use this data to do further machine learning and then, and then go on around and around. Um, and uh, for this simulation, we are uh, frequently using quantum mechanical methods like DFTs. So my talk is organized this way. So first of all, I will uh, present um, Bayesian optimization algorithm. This is a machine learning algorithm, which uh, we use quite often. Um, and actually, um, for solid state materials, I, I present two uh, of recent work. And, uh, and one is design of silicon germanium nanostructures uh, published last year. And, and this, this is um, basically simulation only study. We, we, we used only um, simulations only. And, and uh, in, in the next topic, I will uh, present our new work about wavelength selective thermal radiator design. And, and we, we actually designed such, a, um, such kind of layered materials to, to come up with new uh, thermal radiator. And, uh, and here we did experiments as well. So we, so we, did, we really uh, fabricated, like, like generated um, materials and evaluated. And if time allows, I will mention about our uh, protein design uh, project as well. OK. So what, what is Bayesian optimization? Um, actually, Bayesian optimization is, is a, a technique to find best data points with minimum number of observations. So, yeah, I mean, I, I will explain in data about it. And, uh, and what, what you do effectively is that, um, suppose you did uh, n experiments, and then uh, you have to choose the next experiment, so, so which candidate to choose for, for next uh, experiment. So this is exactly uh, Bayesian optimization can solve. So um, Bayesian optimization choose next point to observe, to discover the best ones as early as possible. And then we use actually machine learning models um, to do that. OK. And first of all, let's see. Um, what, what you do without machine learning. So if you don't use uh, Bayesian optimization, what you do is as follows. So, uh, so this is screening by first principles calculations alone. And, um, and suppose you have a lot of materials, uh, material candidates uh, in the database. And, uh, um, and to choose, for example, um, the best one among these um, candidates, what you do is to apply first principles calculations like DFTs to compute some properties, uh, or properties of materials, uh, and then you you have some scores for all of them, and then you choose uh, the best one, best scores um, material. I mean, um, there's no problem about this, but uh, um, but one thing is it takes time. So so if you apply, you know, if you have only ten of them, it's okay, but. Uh, if you have a really large number of candidates, then it takes so, too much time. So what Bayesian optimization do is, um, first of all, you, you just pick up several several things and, and then apply a uh, uh, simulator first, so like this. And then um, and the next, you take th this as training data and uh, train a Bayesian model. And then, um, and then what you can do is to predict score for the rest, rest of your uh, candidates, like this, like predict the score 4 to predict the score 10. And what's important here is that you also compute uh, variances of, of these predicted scores. And it means um, that, uh, so if you have large variance for your score, then uh, it means that, it, that this, this is uh, not, not so confident. So, so you are not confident about your prediction here. 
And if your variance is very small, then you, you can say that um, your prediction should be uh, very accurate. And, and based on this information you take, you choose the next one to uh, do simulation like this. So, so in this case, you choose this eight. Um, and the one important thing is, it, it's not just, so in this decision, I looked both, uh, both the score and, and variance, right? So, um, so it's very important to take into account this kind of uncertainty. And then, um, and then you do the next step, and then, then go, and, and then you know, repeat this again and again, and, and then, and then you can you know, um, design your experiments um, sequentially like this. Okay. And. Uh, and I said you choose the candidates, um, uh, you know, considering score and variance, right? And then I, I will explain how you do this. And um, and support. I mean, this x-axis is some explanatory variable for for your uh, candidates. And uh, and suppose you did ten experiments already, and you measured some value already, like like this. Uh, and suppose uh, you know upper is better, so larger is better. Then um, then the current maximum one, currently based experiment is this. And the question for you is to um, which you know. Uh, so actually, we have four candidates uh, yet to do experiment. And then the question is, well, which one you choose? And uh, in Bayesian optimization, what you do is to uh, to apply some Bayesian model, and this in this case we apply the Gaussian process to to this data, and then um, and then you get something like this. Actually, I, I apply the Gaussian process to this data, and uh, and this red one, red line is just a regression function, uh, and this blue one shows your variance um, of this function, right? I mean, or standard deviation. And um, and then you choose uh, the next one to observe from these four, according to probability of improvement. Actually, probability of improvement is defined as the probability of getting beyond the current maximum. And uh, if you look at these four points, then this one has the largest uh, probability of improvement because the probability of getting beyond this is like more than 0 0.5, so so it's the best. So you choose this one for for next experiment. And after you, you do experiment here, you never know um, where is the next uh, measurement. This may, may be very bad or maybe may very good. Um, but anyway, we, you, you retrain Gaussian process with uh, one extra data, and then you do the same thing again. OK. OK, we apply this technique to um, the following problem of uh, ROE structure optimization. And uh, this problem is a bit uh, interesting one. And, uh, and suppose um, you have this kind of material um, with silicon reeds. So, so this white one is silicon atoms. And uh, in the middle, um, you have this silicon germanium array region. And you have like 16 positions. And, and you can put eight silicon and eight germanium, as you like. And, and, and your purpose is to maximize or minimize the uh, thermal conductance from here to here. Right. And uh, the number of possibilities here is this. So, so basically, this, this is uh, 16 to 8. So, so this is Japanese way of writing. <laughs> 16 to 8, but, but anyway. Um, and, and, uh, and you have like more than 10,000, 12,000 uh, candidates. So if you just do some calculation to, uh, to compute summer conductance for all of them, it's great, it, it's okay. But uh, we, we don't do this, and we, we accelerate this um, process by using Bayesian optimization. And to define Gaussian process, you need some kind of descriptor. So, so you have to represent your candidates as a, as a set of values. Right? And in this case, we are, we, we are using very simple descriptors. And uh, so this 1 to 16 is the, uh, you know, represent positions. And you put 1 if 
if he if it is gamma new and, and the, you put zero if it is uh, silicon. So it, that's it. And for calculation, um, we use this atomistic Green's function method. And uh, yeah, um, but actually this part is done by my collaborator, and, and, and I, I was I was doing this page optimization. And this is the result. Uh, uh, and basically, the, the left-hand side is uh, represents the result for silicon silicon leads, and uh, the right-hand side you have like silicon germanium leads. And uh, and this panel shows how how Bayesian optimization worked. And this x-axis is the number of calculated structures, and the y-axis shows the thermal conductance, uh, you know, the best thermal conductance obtained so far. And then, um, and then what, what you can see is after uh, several hundred trials, uh, after several hundred computations, um, you could get um, optimal ones, right? And uh, on average, you could get optimal structures using only 30, um, three, three, four, sorry, 3.4 percent of all candidates. And when you look at the result, um, so th this is a result for maximum uh, thermal conductivity. And when you look at it, it's, it's kind of regular. So here you you have, you know, eight germanium uh, on the top and, and eight LC con at the bottom and so on. Um, but when you look at the, this minimum case, this is quite complicated. So um, so basically you have uh, this interface between uh, silicon and germanium like this. And actually the width of each one is not uh, uniform. So, so it's a... It's a periodic structure, and it's a very irregular structure, which, which resulted in the best, um, best structure. So this is very interesting uh, from physics point of view. And, uh, and actually, when we look at our paper, we, we have a lot of discussions about why it is the case. But what, what I can do from um, AI perspective is that uh, this kind of structure is very hard to design by humans, because it's aperiodic, and it's very hard to predict. And we did uh, we did similar stuff for super lattices, and in this case you have uh, layers. Uh, you have ten layers in this case, and uh, you can put uh, five zero manium here and five silicon here, and uh, and we use the same descriptors. And the best structure for minimum uh, thermal conductivity is something like this, like one one zero one zero one zero 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 one. So th this is uh, also very. Uh, complex and uh, aperiodic. Uh, okay. So maybe I cannot really go to. Um, how do I go to begins? Sorry. Um, okay, maybe I can skip video. <laughs> Did they want to see the video? <laughs> uh, you know? How to do this? In okay. Oh, it does not appear. Sorry, I I just well, does it? Oh, here. Oh, so so if if I yeah so if if I move out then it doesn't appear. Okay. But yeah, <laughs> so sorry for this small thing but um but yeah so th this is just to explain um the current uh what what I explained in this and and first so so you have huge number of candidates and then um you just so in the beginning, you just randomly sample um, these from these candidates, and uh, so actually, for for chosen structure, you compute thermal conductance using simulator, and. Uh, And actually, it by yeah, I mean, so so th th this is just image, <laughs> um, but uh, 
so you, you use um, Gaussian process model to to somehow to come up with the best structure. So this, this is what I, yeah, I mean, this is a video that my funding agency made. Okay. Um, yeah. So then uh, I, I move on to this wavelength selective thermal radiator design. And um, actually, thermal radiator uh, is a material that if you give heat, then um, it emits light. So basically, th that's it. But um, these wavelength uh, selective ones uh, emit um, light with, with a certain wavelengths. And it has applications um, together with solar cells like this, and, uh, and maybe heater for drying. But uh, my favorite application is this sky radiator. That um, so this uh, this one emits light with wavelengths which is not uh, absorbed into air. So then it means that when you give some heat to this material, then the then then the light goes through goes through the, to the space. So you can cool the earth. So, so that, that's really like, a, like science fiction, but, but it, it might, um, it's very attractive. One. And, and what we do is to, um, to design this kind of layered material to, to this purpose. Okay. Um, and we design this kind of material, and in this case, um, we use 18 layers. And uh, you fill um, each layer by silicon, uh, so the germanium silicon or silica. And, um, and we also, uh, uh, we also control total thickness um, between 3.6 uh, nanometer to 4.6 nanometer. And then we took uh, 21 grid points between these two, range, this range. And um, then the number of candidate structures is huge, so, so this number, uh, I mean, I cannot read it, but, but this number is um, the number of candidate structures. And what to opt optimize, what, what kind of uh, ma material you want? So, so basically, um, we compute, uh, I mean, g given uh, some candidate of layered material, we compute emissivity spectra using electromagnetic simulation via transfer matrix method, and this is very, actually very quick. So it, it takes less than one second uh, to compute in this case. And uh, we optimize uh, the figure of merit by using Bayesian optimization. And, uh, and you have some target wavelengths here, and then you have some range, uh, very narrow range. And uh, we designed uh, our figure of merit to appreciate uh, peaks near target and the penalizing peaks outside. And uh, the maximum value is one. And actually, um, and when you set the target wavelength to 6.0 uh, micrometer, and then th this is what you get as, as a final result. And uh, interestingly, silicon was not used. So because, uh, I mean, although we prepared three materials, we end up using only two uh, materials. And th this is uh, how Bayesian optimization worked um, for, different, uh, for different total, total thickness. And, um, and actually, we got uh, this after, uh, after only 168 million calculations. And, uh, and actually, I, I, I would say this because it's, it's only 2% of all possibilities. Um, but, but actually, one calculation here is very, very cheap, very, very short. So um, we could do this using like uh, 24 days, 24 cores and 24 days. Um, so it's, yeah, so actually 24 cores is not at all, not, not at all large. It's only one CPU, one, one G on CPU, so not two GPU on CPU, G on CPU normally. No, normally one, one CPU has 12, so two CPUs. And we tried 5.0 micrometer and 7.0 micrometer, and, and you can see slightly different uh, uh, 
slightly or quite different patterns, but, but you can also uh, realize uh, different uh, wavelengths. And actually, we, all, we fabricated it. Um, so actually, we asked some company to, to make it. And, uh, uh, and then this is a calculated spectrum for five, six, seven uh, micrometer. And then uh, in calculation, it's almost perfect. It's, it's really clean and sharp. Um, and then this is uh, the real measurement from our uh, fabricated material. And then when you see this, it, it's a bit shifted. So uh, five is like 5.5 5 or so. It's a bit shifted, but um, and, and the peaks are not, not so uh, high, but, uh, uh, but they are still very uh, distinct. And this is a TEM image for 6.0 micrometer case. And the reason um, that, that our peaks were a bit shifted is that um, the widths of um, experimental uh, realization it's slightly different, like uh, like from 0 0.63, 0 0.69, and so on. I mean, they, they are uh, approximately right, but it, it, it's a bit, um, uh, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, yeah. So, so, so th there's some error, and then we we actually simulated this this with us, and then we observed the shift. So, um, so if we could. Uh, uh, manufacture this uh, more accurately, then we could, um, you know, we could be better. And the comparison with existing materials, um, and actually, um, Q factor I is one way of evaluating this kind of material, and, and, and essentially this evaluates peak sharpness. And our material achieved uh, Q being uh, 273 for simulation and 188 for, for realized. And the highest known Q factor for this kind of material is 200, about about 200. And it's done by 2D grating, coupled surface phonon polar litons. Um, and, uh, and one reviewer says that this, this is not a big deal because you have 200. But it's not so simple. And, and, uh, and actually, this material has large unwanted peaks. So, so if you calculate our big of merit for this material, it's, it's very, very bad. And, um, and our material has very simple structure, just layers. Um, but this one has much, much more uh, complicated structure. So, um, so this was this has high cost. Okay. So I don't know how much time I have, but not not so much. And uh, I I will shortly describe our work for designing proteins using Bayesian optimization. And the protein protein engineering is. Um, I mean, in short, uh, changing some, some part of uh, uh, amino acids to, to get better proteins. Um, but but this, this has a large, large search space, because if you, have K, if you uh, change K residues, then, then you have 20 to the power of K possibilities. Okay. okay, maybe I don't have much time, so. Um, so what we did is um, to give random mutations to some protein. Actually, in this case, we, we use GFPs, right, green fluorescent, fluorescent proteins. And uh, we made uh, some uh, random mutations, and uh, we used it as a training data. And we learned a, a Gaussian process from here, and we designed uh, new proteins, and then we measured. Um, and uh, we, we selected good proteins. And I will show you um, just a picture. So this is what, what, we, what we did. And, and this is the original GFP. And what we did is to, to use um, Bayesian optimization to make it yellow. So we, we changed the wavelengths of GFP and, and created really new YFPs, which is yellow fluorescent proteins. OK. OK, so this is my conclusion. Um, and actually, um, maybe you, uh, you, you can agree with me that um, designing layered material is beyond the ability of human intuition. So, so this, this is be because um, what I like to, 
to deal with these layered materials because um, because probably humans cannot deal with. And uh, and actually accelerating uh, designing of existing material is of course very variable. But what's more interesting for me is to find a new class of materials um, which can only be designed by machine learning. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for this presentation? Yes. May not be. May, maybe this is saying too much. Well, yeah, pro probably. <laughs> but uh, yeah. But actually, mm, I mean, so one one pity about this this thing is that uh, we started out from three materials and we only using two materials. And, and actually, we, when you use two materials, it's not so. Uh, it's not so difficult. But but when you say, maybe we can go ahead and use like five materials or something, then then it's extremely hard. Yeah, sure. Please continue. Mm. Yeah. So, well, I, I mean, we we did se several analysis, but I, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I can show you, show you our paper. So, <laughs> I, I mean, but uh, was the question about the motivation for using silicon instead of silicon? Well, uh, I mean, we, we used uh, both, actually, in the beginning. Um, but, uh, but actually, machine learning chose not to use silicon at all. So why? Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a question. And, and uh, um, um, yeah, I'm not a physicist, so <laughs> I cannot answer. But, but uh, yeah, and also, it's machine learning, so <laughs> no interpretation. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but I guess there, there is some, some reason for that. All right, let's thank the speakers again.